So I will do like a quick intro first. Uh, I already did yesterday. I just want to go over that there is so that you uh, kind of tell you what we are doing. So first, like uh, my name is Toby. Uh, I joined Google like uh, 12 years ago. I'm a developer for relation engineer, which means I focused on improving the developer experience of developer products. And I work on a variety of products, but recently I joined like uh, the Angular function team and I'm focusing on open source function for making custom signals. So the, the, team of, the mission of my team is to make the stuff even easier to build for everyone at scale, just like software. And like the vision is that <laughs> imagine that you can have an optimization track that you can pass to GCC that like speed you a uh, SQL design to optimize like, uh, uh, what you are trying to do with software, but in hardware. Like uh, sometimes in, when you optimize things in software, there is just so much that you can optimize software. And, you often like, uh, fun. at some point you will realize uh, you will reach a point where you need to do an hardware accelerator. And currently there is a big gap. Like, uh, it's not even the same person who can do the two things. And like, our goal is to enable like, uh, co-design so that the same people that work on optimizing software could also work on helping design hardware. And so for that, uh, like, uh, there was a lot of missing pieces uh, two years ago, but the ecosystem has made a lot of progress. So now we have open source PDK, meaning the lower level of the stack for manufacturing silico is open source. Uh, like we managed to uh, develop and improve like the open source solution for making silico, meaning that you have a solution for you to convert your design into a file that you can submit to the company. And uh, there are more and more like uh, a design that people share and a library that people share to an IP block that people share that you can reuse. And uh, there are cheaper manufacturing options now if you want to do custom silico. So we really see like in those two years like the growth of the open source silicon ecosystem. And so I, I mentioned the open source PDK. So there is actually like two PDK uh, that Google has uh, worked directly with uh, the foundry for them to open source it. It's a PDK, the 180, the 130 nanometer from Skywater and the 180 nanometer from Global Foundry. So we work with them to find the right license and bring them open source something that works with the open source tool. Uh, but recently, we've seen also a new trend from other foundry that without even having Google talking to them, that go and like, open source of PDK. And that's like what happened with AHP. So it's a foundry from uh, Austria. And they released uh, their PDK. Uh, like, kind of, if you look at their repo, it, uh, they try to follow the same organization that uh, we did with Skywire and Global Foundry. And I think it's great to see that uh, because it means that more, there will be more and more options for people to do a custom system. And also, like the two chain will be better because currently, like uh, the two chain were very skewed toward uh, Skywater and the Foundry, and like the, the the process that AHP needs is very different. So the two will also need to adapt, and the ecosystem will get better. So this is one example of a two chain that uh, at least we put together uh, uh, by combining the project that we have already there. There is like multiple way, uh, multiple tools that you can substitute there. But just like one two chain that works for converting like your design to actual file that you can submit to the foundry. So um, and when you come from a software uh, background, you're not necessarily uh, well versed into very log, like uh, into language like very log or VHDL. So sometimes people use what they call the nine level synthesis. And Google is actually developing like a nine level synthesis toolkit called HS. And so there is a little language in there called DSLX that allows you to describe hardware with a syntax that close to Rust. And so it's really approachable for someone who comes like me from software because they can try to convert like the algorithm that they want to accelerate uh, into that language and generate some Verilog out of it. So once you have your X, X file uh, and you can convert it to Verilog, you can run it through a tool for doing synthesis that call, that's called Ulysses. So it's a tool that I mentioned this morning that's very also very well used inside the FPGA world to do synthesis to map to an FPGA. Here you do the same operation but you map it to the actual PDK that you want to use. So I will use UCS to make sure that I to like, convert my design into a series of get and at least that, uh, that target like, the process that I want to target. So in that case today, we're gonna, I'm going to show a demo on how we target the Sky 130 process. Then there is a place and node tool which you have that list of components that uh, represent your design. You want to map them on the silicon die into like, so that it fits within that die and so that like, the get are closer close enough to each other to meet the timing that you want to uh, do. And for that, there is a tool called Open Road that does this place in the operation. And then the last test is that you want to stream to generate a file that you can actually send to the foundry. And that, so that file format is called GTS. So this will take like, the design data from Open Road and actually generate a, a series of basically polygon and rectangle that you can like, submit to the foundry. And for that, there is two tools that we use called Magic and Kaleos. 
So like uh, at first, like two years ago, it was very difficult to install all of those tools. But we've made a lot of progress into packaging those tools into things that um, are readily available in two more environments like Conda. So like uh, if today you run that inside the Conda environment, you can get the PDK, uh, the open end tool that uh, contains like uh, that depend on all the tools for the new CD space and open GDS streaming, and also XLS, which you can go uh, uh, iOS PDK. And um, there is also like a, a, a one, one other barrier was for people to be able to share their design with each other. Like uh, it might be you know how to run the tool, you know how to run them inside the correct order. You might have a pretty picture of your uh, of your chip that uh, maybe you want to share with someone else. And there is there was nothing really that was tying all of that together. So we started using like Jupyter notebooks to do that because it's very convenient. You have like a series of um, text that you can put with command that people need to execute and instead of just being a readme that people were copy. People that could be a cut snippets inside the terminal, that's actually something that you can execute. And you can produce interesting visualization about your chip and how it works. And so that's like uh, what I want to demo today. Uh, there is this project like on the Chip Alliance repo where we store a lot of notebooks that are using the two chain. And uh, I want to show how it looks like. So if you want to follow along, feel free to open that URL and play with the notebook yourself. Uh, I will go quickly through one and that show how to. Of that work. Another aspect is that it's uh, like you don't have to install anything on your computer if you want to do that if you're using uh, a notebook hosted service like Collab. So Google also has a, uh, a notebook hosted service called Collaboratory where if you start a machine uh, in the cloud to physically run the code that's inside the notebook. Is there a Collab link also? Collab. Right. Do you have Collab link? Do you have this notebook also? Yeah, yeah, so that was on the URL that I mentioned here. So if you go to that URL, uh, ah. yeah. the URL that I just um, so yeah, if you go into that URL here, um, oh. you you will find like a series of notebooks that you can open from the menu. The actual one that I'm going to use today is that one. It's less workshop anymore. Great. And so that's like a, a notebook that we used. Uh, it's too small. So that's a notebook that we use for running workshop in Tokyo, in the University of Tokyo, uh, to uh, get actually CS students that know nothing about uh, our design, but familiar with the concept of chip design and familiar with the tool that you can use. So the first thing that it does uh, and that you need to do is to click this cell to install like the package that I mentioned. And after um, after the after that, like, there is a small introduction text about HLS. So HLS is basically this high-level synthesis tool that I mentioned before, where you can like describe your uh, the operation that you want to accelerate in either C plus plus or VSX, which is this desktop plus. It really like it really works like a compiler. It will have like an intermediate representation. It will allow you to run some interpreter and some tests. So you will, like, as a software engineer, you will feel right at home because you will be able to validate your design by writing like a uh, unit test. And then you can run a series of optimization and finally like spit out like the value that you can plug with the rest of the solution. So like uh, the design that we are gonna do today is like very simple. It's gonna be like uh, a chip that adds to it. So it's gonna so here you see that uh, using that language I can write a function. It takes two arguments, one and B, that are all like one that are both like one bit wide. So are you uh, U1. And it returns another like uh, value, which is a YouTube. So because like if you you can overflow and have a carry, so I need two bits to start. And I really describe my operation like I would describe in software, saying that like the result is equal to A plus B. And uh, because I want my this function is like uh, the core of my design. But I want to wrap that into an actual chip. And so like today I've decided to that I'm going to use a chip that has eight inputs and eight outputs. So it has eight pin in and eight pin out. So I need to decide like which pin I want to send to this adder and which pin I want to uh, and which pin I want to um, send uh, as a output. And because it's like code, I can write unit tests. So I can verify that um, this adder is actually working. So if I press here. I can write, I can see that the tests are working. 
So um, now that I have like this description, I can really go to change to convert it to this intermediate language called um, XLSIR. So here I see like a, a more a view of the lower level operation that I, I would have performed that would be performed inside the operation. And then I can generate a very good one using the same function. And here it's a bit silly because um, that that design is so simple that uh, it's actually um, very similar in very low of the way you would write that thing. You would just write like a, I want to add to it a new plus operation. And then once we have that very log, we can connect it to the rest of the open source uh, system blockchain. So I can take my very log, run it through the synthesis tool, run it through for planning, go it all the way to GS streaming, and get a file that I can send to the phone. So for that, I need to specify like uh, what is the name of my project, uh, what is the very log file I want to use. Uh, if I if I need a clock, I need to specify the frequency of my clock. And I also need to specify more physical constraints, like how big will be my chip. So here it's going to be 50 micron, and how fast I want uh, the gate and my chip together. So here I say I want 30% density. I also need to decide things like um, where do I want my pin? So here I'm saying I want like the IO, the, the input pin on the left, and the output pin on the right. And you notice that the IO pin here and the out actually corresponds to um, what I used inside my code. Right. And once you do this, you can run like a first operation, which is synthesis, which will basically convert like for uh, um, like very log, uh, uh, or very log description of the design that we want to do, like so this like one plus B, into uh, actual gates uh, that are using the PDK that we want to target, which is the Skywalker process. So once we run that flow, uh, now we get like a, a representation of um, basically a netlist to describe the gates uh, that implement this operation and how they are connected together. And so here you see that for adding two numbers, I need to get I need a XOR gate uh, for computing the lower uh, level bits. And I need an AND gate to compile the most significant bit. And so I can see uh, that those gates are uh, where they are getting the wire from from the input. I can see how they are combining the, the wire. Uh, the, the bit at the end, and I can see how they are showing it to the bit. The next step is to do floor planning. So now I need to take those gates and put them somewhere. Uh, I need to kind of uh, just, like, prepare the place for putting those gates on my chip. So after I run the floor planning, I should have like, um, like this, um, like an actual chip that has the dimension that I want, so this 50 micron. You can see here, uh, I have the input pin, this is the eight input pin, the eight input pin. I have the power delivery network that will allow me to power my gate. And the two gates are still here in the bottom. They are not placed because I didn't do it because I didn't do placing all yet. So here you can see there is a on gate here and the, the or gate over there. So next step uh, that we need to do is placement. So now we're going to take like, uh, those two gates and we are going to try to place them somewhere where there is space on our chip. It's not very hard because no chip is empty. <laughs> but, uh, so they will, they will end up somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So here we can see there is a two gate here and the other. We can even like, remove like, the IO in the So you can see. Yeah. Yeah. And so. The, the last step of the next step is to use routing. So we need to actually connect the pin of this gate together uh, so that they actually electrically, electrically uh, like, are connected like the netlist that we have at the beginning. And so at the end of routing, uh, we get something like that. Uh, it totally as this, and this, this. So here you can see we have our two gates. You can see like there is a wire that comes from the input that goes into the first stop gate. There is a wire that goes from the input. second input there that goes inside my or, uh, my my or gate, my door gate. Then this door gate is connected to the on gate there, and the output of the on gate connected to the student. 
So now, like, I have a physical representation uh, using like the process that I want to target that implements the circuit that does the other. And the next step is to uh, stream the GPS, and uh, then you get like a fully functioning, uh, a fully uh, complete layout uh, that you can submit to the format of application. And a series of metrics, and you get to check if like this uh, design, the way the polygons are mapped together, actually conform like to the constraint uh, that the file has for manufacturing matching. So there is a series of rules that need to follow uh, for doing that. And so like that was a bit of a toy design, right? Like it's just uh, something that had like two number. But we can also like uh, do more complicated designs. So like here, for example, we can easily turn like this adder into something that multiply two number. So if we run that, um, we can get the very low there. And um, if we do the synthesis, we're going to see that multiplication is not as trivial as it looks like. <laughs> and that I need a lot of gate uh, to actually implement this, uh, this multiplication. It's not even big enough to fit on the screen. Uh, uh, we get, we're going to see that uh, when we run the, the, the actual flow. You can see here, uh, I'm going to run the flow and try to uh, put that inside the chip that I defined. And we see it fail. And the reason we fail is that there is not enough space to put all those gates on the chip. <laughs> so for it not to fail, I'm going to make the chip a little bit bigger. Hello, I can see the reports, and you're asking how many gates there were. Um, so there is like 69 gates. And here we have a breakout of what we are actually used to do like our multiplication. So when we write the code, we just write one character, uh, and we don't really realize that uh, actually to be implemented in hardware, it's a lot of, lot of circuitry. So we have 10 gates, like uh, 7 nodes, like 2 nodes, 7 zor, 13 Seven or something so there is a lot of gate there. And that's eight bit by eight bit, right? A four bit by four. Four bit by <laughs> And uh, yeah, if we take a look at the gate uh, as a chip, it's kind of look like this. So you see, like um, like the tool are to do have to, to do a lot of more work there to like lay out all these gates, and we actually didn't have enough a silicon space to to do that. So like, if you want to follow and we do this tutorial at home, it's all like inside that window that I mentioned, and there is a, a few more exercises uh, toward the end when we, we actually go through the um, step of planning that design. So making sure that we can execute this multiplication into multiple cycles to reduce uh, uh, to try to reduce like uh, the latency, improve like the, the throughput of all them. And so let me try to continue and tell you like how what I think that book are also useful for. So we've seen here, they are useful for designing. I can run a tutorial, a workshop. Uh, I can share a design with you that will produce my chip and you can run it on your computer and get a pretty picture. Uh, but it's also uh, useful for research. And so like inside of the LSI field, there is actually a problem for reproducible research. Uh, like when uh, someone publishes a paper at a conference and seeing like a breakthrough into a computer architecture, like usually what they submit to the conference is a PDF. And there is a little table in there that says, oh, on this process, using this proprietary tool, I got this result. And the table is the only thing that we validate the results. And 
it compare like the research, the research to other projects that may be uh, older project or uh, project that are do, doing the similar concurrently at this conference. And there is actually no way that you can compare those things together because they are not using the same process. You, can, you cannot run the same thing to reproduce it yourself. And so, like, um, your book can also be a, good, a useful thing for that. Like, instead of submitting a PDF that's static that just presents your results, you can actually submit a recipe that your book can reproduce on your own. It might target an older process, so it won't have like the same performance as uh, as like a, a state of the art thing. But it could help people like build on top of your research and also allow people to collaborate together. And so, like um, the IEEE uh, and Secret Society, at least started like something that I think is a great initiative. So they are based on the same toolchain, based on the same GPKMs, and they basically invite any student from any university to submit notebook to get invited to their conference to present their work. So usually those are like conferences that are, you can't really get in if you are uh, an undergrad because you, it's like too prestigious to get in. And that's an easy way for them to, uh, to get inside of this and to get familiar with the construction. And they've got like 14 projects just submitted uh, last week for the upcoming days at uh, conference that they in Japan. I think that was like great. Uh, thank you. And like the other thing that the book are great uh, are for is for uh, doing experiment and doing visualization. And actually like if you, Parameterize your notebook, you can run like the same recipe that I was doing here with a fixed size. I can try to run the same notebook with many, many different sites and analyze, for example, things like the Google consumption. And here it's a little ex experiment I did on Google Cloud where I run like 10,000 uh, 10, jobs, like I've just shown you, uh, with different size and different density uh, for a more, much more complicated design, like the RIS 5 core. And I analyzed like the, po the power consumption from each of the designs during simulation. And here we can see each of those dots is like one of the jobs that we've run together there. And like the, 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 the pool of the dot is like the, the lesser it consumed. And you can see here, you can, there is like a, you can have a nice uh, like sweet spot there um, between the density and uh, the area where I consume the less energy. And maybe that's something that's very uh, uh, well known inside the field. If you have like 10 or, or maybe 30 years of experience, you know that if you have the good trade off between uh, area and density, like uh, you end up consuming less. But for me, that's like new to the field, or for anyone, that they can start using like, the structural resource and start accruing that future uh, without spending 20 years just by consuming like a lot of resources. And like in order to fabricate like this design, we run like a program like during two years that allow people to submit designs that have been uh, 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 that have been uh, created using this open source tool and to get them manufactured at no cost as long as the design is open. So Google has been running uh, those shuttles like, for two years, um, and we've run nine of them, and we've seen an increase in number of engagement. Yeah, like you can see at the very beginning, we were getting only 30 projects, now we are getting as much as 140 projects to the last shuttle. And like people are submitting from all over the world, it's a very diverse community. And like currently, we, we are busy like, trying to bring up like, the design for the second one. Uh, and so people got back their silicon. I have an example here of uh, one of the chip. And like uh, they're trying to run like validation uh, to make sure that um, that chip is working. So we had like we bumped into some issue with the toolchain, we bumped some, some issue for some of the parts uh, that were coming by default inside the silicon. There was like some a tiny violation that people needed to work around to, but the community kind of got together, managed to produce the right uh, characterization logic to uh, bring it to uh, both of the chip, and we've seen a good result uh, of people that are getting uh, working signal. One example that I wanted to show you is that actually this chip down there, which I think is very interesting. So here you see the 40 chip that got submitted to the shuttle. So each of those is like an open source design. But inside of this one, you can see that there is like many other elsewhere. It's actually a, a design from an online course. So someone ran an online course for uh, designing chip. And they ended up taking one of the specs there and like putting 16 design of it in, inside of it. And so as part of the curriculum of that course, you have to produce a design. And then uh, at the end of the course, you will manufacture the design on that shuttle. And that person had like no interaction with Google. They did like totally that uh, on top of the infrastructure that we were providing. And uh, I actually got like a copy of that chip uh, that's like here. And so it's the one that's inside the uh, upper corner here. It's a very trivial design. So it's a Fibonacci generator. And so it just takes 30 pin of the design and would put a Fibonacci number on every cloud cycle. And, but I wanted to verify that this chip is actually working. And so I could run like, uh, like the bring up segments that left the designer uh, as on my computer. It was difficult for me to share the results. 
this on that. So I ended up creating like uh, another notebook uh, that allowed me to do that. So it kind of like goes through the through the setup for finding like uh, the configuration of the IO that actually work. And I can show you uh, quickly um, each write has some firmware that we initialize the IO. So actually, we just call this fact chip, and then we have this chip that we manufacture that's here for bringing up the IO and connecting to the logic that the designer is uh, putting together. So I configure the IO pin there, and I start uh, like the design. And after I'm done with that, uh, I'm actually connecting to a board that's underneath here. Uh, so you, so you see, like you have like the chip, like you have a hat, and underneath you have a little like uh, nuclear board. And on this there is actually micro Python that's right. So I could write some Python logic uh, that will uh, try to read the pin of the design and verify that the behavior is right. So here, like, um, I'm connected to one of the pins that represent the clock of that chip. And you can see on every iteration, I'm uh, clocking the device. So I'm just uh, turning the clock from 0 to 1. And so that will like, step through the logic of that chip. It will, it will get the clock and execute that very lock and we put the next one in the And on each clock cycle, um, reading uh, all the GPIO and putting them back inside the number. And so you can see here, these are all the numbers that I was able to read. And then I can execute some Python now on my computer um, to actually um, like take those uh, files that I got on the device and put them into a panda data file that I can actually read. Like, so like, Python is great at doing that. And then I can, uh, on the local computer, I like, do uh, the real Fibonacci. Uh, Thing and like try to see if the result are the same. They can look similar. And then I can try to visualize them and see like, for each of the bits of my design, uh, each of the IO of my pin, we have the same thing that the people that she has. And so that's one example of, of how you can like, create a bring up sequence that anybody can reproduce. And you know, when you manufacture silicone, like not all the ships are equal. Some of them ships are somewhere right inside the wafer and might be at, uh, not similarly. And, I got that actually another chip that I got there. I rerun the same thing. And you see, it didn't go so well. <laughs> there is like some of the pins that are not matching. So that's like definitely something that's uh, convenient. So I can get like, those chips one by one, pre test them. And uh, uh, like I got this little uh, sheet there where I'm taking the chip one by one and kind of return them if they work on it. And so, yeah, that's what I wanted to show. I invite you like, to join uh, like the community. Uh, we have a Slack community with like, more than 4,000 members there. There is this uh, portal that we put together, they have a lot of developments on Shilicon. Um, there is uh, actually an opportunity to tap out uh, this month uh, with a project called Tap Me Tap Out. So they take like, one slot of a similar shuttle, but instead of putting one project in, they put uh, 200 projects. And so they're able to bring the, uh, down the cost of the shuttle like, pretty dusty. So you can get uh, the design there for $25. And if you want to actually get a chip uh, uh, for, for that include actually the 200 project, uh, you, you, can, you can just pay $100. You, can, you have to pay $100, but you get like, a chip plus a PC. And so, yeah, that's not something that's uh, tied to Google, but um, it's just like a cool initiative inside the community I wanted to point out. And uh, later today, there is a talk from Shen Cross, who is actually a user of Shen, and we did like, a lot of uh, experimentation to, to try to build the SOC uh, using this open source tool. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Uh, questions? I'm sure there is. Yes, the my question was about the, the higher level abstraction above yeah. basically XSL or XLS. Yeah. Uh, I assume that that same abstraction can be used as a precursor to an FPGA. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It can use to be used for FPGA as well. And uh, one interesting characteristic of it is that um, it has these intermediate languages that could be cheated. And so you could execute on your uh, computer mm -hmm. like native code that implements the same thing as well. So for like very fast simulation, uh, that's actually very good. Any more questions? Wait, what? Yes. Uh, yes. So you talk about. Uh, yeah. So you talk about like a, a, a certain way to, like, I would say, uh, program the chips, right? Yeah. Is it similar to like how you did it as a computer? Yeah. No, like you didn't have like directly programming their 
But so uh, like um, there is like multiple layer. So the lowest level is that you design, you can actually design your own CPU and put it on that chip. And then there is like a, you can upload like your own firmware that uh, get executed on that custom architecture that you design. So, so, so there is like the code that is compiled specifically for that chip, right? So like on there is let me um, go back to so on three six. That one. Is So yeah, so you can see here that's like one of the chips that helps me live on the shuttle. Uh, like underneath here is like a management stock that comes on every single project. There is a little risk file on every single project that can allow you to kind of verify that your design is working. So that's like something where you can put your own firmware and that's you program it in C, you, you flash that firmware and it gets executed when the chip will up. And then there is like your custom logic here. Which is connected like a through series of pin to that RIS5 chip. And so from your RIS5 firmware, you can actually send some IO, all the IO of your custom design and verify that it's wrong. And there, there are cases, for example, like this project, where they ended up implementing like a RIS5 CPU inside the user area. So you have like the little RIS5 CPU here that's here that we provide that's here for uh, doing the diagnostic, but the user design itself is also a RIS5 CPU that then have its own firmware and communicate with that other RIS5 CPU. And like um, that one is even more fun because like using the Skywalker uh, process, they were able to implement the FPGA, and so like they had to design like the fabric for the FPGA, where you can like flash a bit stream that's uh, done using the open source tool, and then like from the little Furious file that's over there, you can like pull the FPGA and like, verify it actually do what the bits are doing, and so and they, they they run some pretty impressive demo on that FPGA here. So. That was really interesting. So there is really, really like multiple layer where you could program that thing. You could have that designing the design that you put in silicon there. It's, it's an act of programming because you can describe it uh, uh, with the syntax that's close to code. But there is also like the thing that you run on the thing that you design, uh, which is also another way of programming. Yes. All right. Um, any more questions? Otherwise, we have to wrap up. Okay. Thank you very much, Johan. Yeah. Uh, Thank you.